Hello and welcome. Um, in this session, we're going to talk about Elasticsearch or OpenSearch. We're going to use the terms interchangeably for the most part. We're going to talk about them in the context of logs and other time series data. And we'll focus on using a Kubernetes operator to manage Elasticsearch clusters um, in this context. But before we start, let us introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Radu. I'm a search person at Sematext. And um, uh, most of my time goes into consulting, production support, and training for Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, and Solar. And sometimes I contribute to our observability platform, which is called Sematext Cloud. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Ciprian. Uh, I'm a consultant uh, for Kubernetes and automation, and also work as a software engineer for PolyPoly, Poly, mostly on privacy-related projects. Uh, also, in my spare time, I'm an open source maintainer, contributing to many of the projects in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So let's start with uh, the agenda. We'll talk about why we want to have such, uh, such an operator, so the use cases. Uh, we will talk about how, how it should work, when should it uh, scale up and down, and what should we do when it does that, and available options, and last, a quick demo of our proof of concept. Let's start with the why. If you have a small cluster, then you don't want to think about Elasticsearch to learn all about it, the ins and outs, and you would like to have as less maintenance as possible. So ideally, zero maintenance. This kind of operator would help you get started with your logging without caring about learning Elasticsearch too much. For bigger clusters, uh, usually these clusters are multi-tenant, and you, you could split them easier because it's not such a big maintenance to have multiple clusters if you have the operator. OK. All right, moving on to how. So in other words, what does the operator um, need to do in order to auto scale. Um, in order to get there, I want to talk about three things. So one is uh, using time-based indices. So if you use, for example, Logstash before, you might have noticed that it creates one index per day. Um, we're going to talk about why that's a good idea. Um, next, um, I'm going to argue that for most use cases, rotating by size instead of by time uh, will work better. Um, and the third thing would be um, how would those indices behave when you scale your cluster uh, up and down. Um, so let's start with, with time-based indices. You know, it, they don't have to be daily. You can have like one index per month or one index per hour. Um, but the idea is the same. And the advantages are pretty big. So when it comes to indexing, uh, typically uh, the bottleneck um, is uh, down to the uh, Lucene segment merges, which happen in the background. And if you're indexing in a smaller index, it's going to be much, much faster. So we're, we're basically comparing the time-based indices with just indexing everything in, in one index. When it comes to searches, most of the searches tend to be in the latest data. So we, um, again, if we have it broken down by time, we can hit just a slice of our data. Um, and that's going to be faster. But even if we search in um, all the data, even, um, because all their indices are not written anymore, they're much uh, more easily cacheable by both Elasticsearch and the operating system underneath it. So um, in my experience, both indexing and searches will be orders of magnitude faster with this design compared to having just one index. And finally, when you delete, when you have to expire data, um, with time-based indices, you can simply delete whole indices, which by and large um, implies deleting some files on disk, as opposed to deleting documents from within an index, which are only uh, soft deletes and will trigger additional um, Lucene segment merges. In practice, you would have like multiple series of such 
time-based indices. Um, um, normally, um, we would break them down by uh, how you'd search them. So for example, if uh, we search Nginx logs uh, separately than syslog uh, in general, we don't have to, like we can always search through everything, then it makes sense to keep them in separate index series. But this design is not perfect, and uh, um, we may run into um, what we call the Black Friday problem. So let's say we are an e-commerce um, uh, website and we're logging access logs. And so hopefully during Black Friday we will have a lot more traffic, and so that index will grow larger, but much larger than the indices from the following Saturday or Sunday, and then you have Cyber Monday, and then again it's a spike of traffic, and then again it goes down, and so on and so forth. And the problem is that um, the big indices that will get generated on Friday and, and Monday will um, behave much like that big index that we talked about before. So indexing will be slower, searches will be slower exactly when we need them the most. So to fix this problem, we can rotate indices by size instead of by time. So the, the way this works is, at least typically, uh, we would have a, an alias that will point to an index, and Logstash will write to that alias, or whatever uh, puts data into Elasticsearch. And then when that index gets to the target size, uh, typically 10 gigabytes per shard is, is like a good rule of thumb in, in our tests, um, we're going to create a new index. We're going to flip um, the alias to the new empty index, and then we can continue writing there, and we just keep on doing that. Um, thankfully, there's some automation in recent versions of both Elasticsearch and OpenSearch. In OpenSearch, this is called index state management, and in um, Elasticsearch, it's called index lifecycle management. And these um, can be used to automate this process of, okay, let's create a new index, let's flip the alias, even let's remove old um, indices, which is gonna be a bit more challenging uh, in this context because you don't have indices strictly divided by time. Um, of course, this design isn't perfect either. Um, so for example, if you need to backfill data, right, we're just onboarding some new project that already has a lot, lots of logs, those will all go into the latest index, and that's problematic. Um, and also when we're searching, let's say we're searching the last 24 hours, which indices contain uh, those 24 hours? This is a bit harder to figure out, though Elasticsearch, uh, again, will have this kind of stuff out of the box. So shards that don't have data matching your uh, time frame will quickly kind of dismiss your query saying zero. Okay, so how does this work in the context of auto scaling? So let's start with the simplest, or one of the simplest examples. Uh, let's say we have uh, two Elasticsearch nodes and we have one index uh, with two shards. So we have a spike in load, let's say we want to auto scale. We add a new node, obviously we cannot take advantage of it. Even if we had previous indices before, it's, some shards will migrate, but the third node will not be able to contribute to indexing, which is our main load. Um, so our suggestion is to say, okay, even if we're not at 10 gigabytes per shard or whatever our threshold is, let's force rotate the index um, and like create a new one uh, that will be evenly spread out throughout our cluster, and this way all three nodes can, can contribute to indexing. And this will typically imply three steps. So one, we would change the index template, so normally all your settings and mappings and all that stuff will live in index templates so that when you create a new index, it will inherit everything. So we'll need to change that uh, template to say three shards instead of two. And um, we're gonna do this uh, forcing, force rollover, like create the index and, and, and flip the alias. And finally, we may need to adjust the um, um, life cycle policy. So if, if the life cycle policy said uh, 20 gigabytes before because we have 10 gigabytes per shard times two shards. Now it has to say 30 gigabytes in order to um, keep consistency. And we're going to do much of the same when we need to scale back down. Um, the only difference would be uh, that we need to make sure that nodes are properly drained before we shut them down, right? So we would exclude them from allocation and then Elasticsearch would move the shards off of them before uh, we take them down. But once we take them down, uh, we get into a similar problem as before in the sense that the cluster is not balanced, 
right? So in order to make it balanced again, we can do the same thing. Change the template back to two shards, force rollover, and adjust the, um, um, the policy again. Does that make sense? Cool. So that's what we're trying to automate. But before we get there, I want to talk about three more sort of best practices. We can't be comprehensive here in terms of best practices, but I think these three are important, especially in this context. So one of them is that it's often tempting to uh, judge um, the size of a cluster based on indexing throughput, because that's our main workload. We do much more indexing than searches, typically. Um, so let's say um, we index one million documents per second. What kind of cluster do we need? But typically, the um, unit of scale would be either search latency or just outright disk uh, usage. Um, because if we, wanna, if we index one million documents per second, but we want to keep this data for like one month, we'll need a big cluster. And that big cluster would be big enough to index um, one million documents per second, right? So this is typically what we will look for. And since searches are our bottleneck for scaling, then um, I think it's worth mentioning that searches do lots of random I.O. So uh, I.O. latency tends to be more important than throughput or even IOPS. So with most cloud providers, we would typically go for the local SSDs, the ephemeral storage, rather than the managed over the network disks because we have much, much better latency and so we can uh, put a lot more data on the same node. Now, obviously, this has a downside in the sense that if the node goes down, it takes the storage with it. Um, so we'll have to account for that either by having more replicas. Obviously, it depends on how important the data is um, and regular backups um, um, to sort of compensate. Um, and the last one is you may have heard of hot, warm, cold, colder kind of architectures. The idea is um, you have like your, let's say, best hardware in the hot tier. That's where your indexing happens. That's where most of your searches, uh, recent searches will happen. And uh, as data becomes less relevant, we move it down to lesser hardware. Um, frankly, our uh, proof of concept does not support this, but I'm not sure if it's needed because um, I think there's, a lim there's limited use of this design because you cannot put like trash hardware on the cold tier because Elasticsearch will still keep, need to keep the data open. It still needs to be able to monitor itself and stuff like that. And if the call tier is too slow, it will just become unstable. It's not the problem that you wait like 30 seconds more for a query. It's just it's gonna, the nodes will drop out and stuff like that. Um, but if the, so if the call tier is fast enough, um, at least this is what we know. It's like, hey, these, are, these nodes are idling. We might as well get them back to work and, and do indexing, and then you end up back to like a flat uh, kind of design. OK, so um, this idea of an Elasticsearch operator is not new at all. So we thought, OK, let's see what existing operators um, can help us with. And unfortunately, a lot of them are either unmaintained or they don't do auto scaling at all. Um, and um, but there is one um, by Elastic that obviously supports Elasticsearch very well. It's called Elastic Cloud and Kubernetes. Trouble is, it's not exactly open search. We don't want to get into that flame war, but uh, not open search, not open source, <laughs> um, uh, because it's, it's on the Elastic license. But uh, particularly for auto scaling, um, you need to pay, you need, you need an enterprise license. Um, there's, I think it's worth mentioning uh, Opster, which is an operator um, used by open search and it's under active development, but right now it does not support auto scaling. It's on the roadmap, but it's not there yet. So the one we went for is called ES Operator. It's from Zalando. It was presented at KubeCon, Cloud Native Con before. Um, and it is open source. Um, it does support auto scaling. It does support draining uh, nodes, like um, what I mentioned. We need to move shards off before. Um, uh, shutting the node down when we scale down. And it works really well for, uh, let's say, e-commerce type of use cases. So when you have one or more indices and you just want to increase your cluster capacity to, to handle them, even if that means adding additional replicas. So that works really well. 
uh, but we wanted to change it so that it works for logs, so that it does this template management and lifecycle policy management and the force rotate, everything that, that I talked about before. Uh, and this is what uh, Ciprian will show you uh, in a second. Okay. So uh, we're going to do the demo right now. Uh, I will start uh, with uh, a little uh, about uh, the Zalandu operator inner workings. Um, it requires you, first of all, to have your own master deployment before running it. So it's not fully managed, the cluster. Uh, but after that, you have some uh, simple options that uh, control uh, scaling and other various aspects, like uh, excluding system indices from any calculation that the cluster, uh, that the operator does. Um, in our case, uh, the most important uh, options are the minimum replicas, maximum replicas that we allow for it to, to create. And we will be using uh, disk usage percent uh, for uh, scaling up and down uh, the cluster. Okay, um, so at the moment, um, we have already prepared the uh, the demo in Docker, um, in Kubernetes Docker, so it's uh, pretty easy to, to do without networking. Um, as you can see, there is only the master. Um, we already applied the, this uh, configuration, and once we will start the operator, it will create the data nodes, uh, and then uh, we will show how it scales up, how it applies the templates, um, the ISM configuration, uh, and what it does um, at each scaling step. So starting uh, the operator now. Okay. Immediately it notices that uh, it needs uh, two replicas and it has none. Um, already started the pods. And looking here, it should take uh, very little to get the cluster up and uh, running. Until then, uh, let's, um, let's look at the cluster health. So it's a green cluster. Uh, there's no index yet. There is no template. There is pretty much nothing. As you can see, it already found that the nodes are healthy. It created uh, the component template for Logstash and also a separate component template for scaling. And then it applied it to the index. You can see that it applied both log stash and the scaling components. Uh, and it also created the ISM policy uh, with uh, minimum size 10 gigs. Okay, let's see here. Indices, we have one index with one uh, primary shard and one replica. Um, we have the template with log stash and scaling. Um, and the cluster should be healthy. So it's still green. Uh, if we go back to the configuration, we can change uh, this uh, scale up percent boundary to 21%. This is something that works on my setup. We don't have the time to ingest that many logs or data to, to do a real demo, so we just fake it with uh, re decreasing the thresholds. So um, let's see. Uh, okay. Should be applied, and very soon it should uh, detect that um, the bound, the disk usage percent boundary has been reached, and it should start adding more replicas. 
while it add more it adds more replicas it will reconfigure uh, the scaling template the ism uh and roll the logstash index to to match the new number of nodes with best, best practices oh, let's see oh okay uh, still waiting for the third node to be ready, I guess. Um, okay. So let's see here how it does. Uh, but okay, it should be up and running. And we should see how it sets the scaling template right now to to match the number of nodes and it increases the ISM policy to uh, minimum size to 30 gigs to match the three primary shards. Uh, because uh, all the nodes that we have share the same storage, it will not stop at uh, three replicas right now. It will go down, uh, it will go up until uh, the maximum uh, allowed by the configuration, so four replicas. Uh, and once it reaches that uh, threshold, uh, we will uh, change back the uh, scale up disk percent boundary, and we will make it go back to to the way it was to two nodes. And at that time, it will start recreating each uh, index. Um, no, not recreating, sorry, uh, rolling the indices and um, applying uh, the correct uh, scaling template for them. So right now, if we will be looking here, indices, you can see that we no longer have one. We already have three uh, created uh, at each step. So it started with one uh, primary and one replica, then uh, it went to three primaries and one replica so that uh, the allocation can be uniform on that amount of nodes. And lastly, it went to two primaries and one replica. So I guess right now we should have the cluster with four nodes. It should be healthy. Um, let's see. So it's healthy. Um, we can try to see that the ISM policy was applied correctly. So it's 20 gigs, the minimum size for all over, as we expected. Um, and um, scaling, and the scaling template matches what we see in the in the logs. Okay. Uh, Reducing this, uh, changing this back to 75% and increasing this to 25% 20, uh, the scale down disk usage percent boundary so that it starts uh, decreasing in size uh, applying. So right now it should quickly scale down, uh, also uh, drain the nodes at uh, each step and reapply the scaling templates um, to, to indices while rolling them. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, indices, you can see already have the fourth index that's matching the second one created, like three primaries and one replica. And pretty soon, it w you see it draining the pods, ensuring the cluster is green. And pretty soon, it will get to uh, two ready nodes instead of four as it was in the past. So indices, it's already at five indices. And we have, again, two data nodes in Elasticsearch. Um, 
at the moment, this is pretty much uh, hard-coded, many of the things that we did here. It was mo it's mostly a proof of concept, but we want to improve it and uh, publish it uh, as a usable solution for people that want to do logs. Um, and I think uh, this concludes our demo. So thanks everyone for uh, coming here and watching us. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. <laughs> Uh, no, no, it's not for me, should I keep it? I don't know. Uh, so uh, basically, at the end, you have a uh, Logstash uh, 05 index with three, three primary shard and one replica for each, but you have only two nodes in your cluster. So is the cluster beginning to be yellow at that point? No, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't three, it was one at the very end. Can, can no, you, no, it, you have an index with three, three primary at some point, and you keep it. So the cluster should ah. be yellow, right? It's uh, not yellow because we, when we, oh, do you want to take this? Sorry. So we modified the shards per node setting while scaling down, okay. so it allows the cluster to scale down properly. We don't want, we don't want that part to scale, uh, to hold back the scaling. Okay, thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Yeah, just uh, more of a high-level question on the, the operator. So um, the reason I'm interested in this is because I, I have some uh, customer-facing real data, not necessarily for the observability aspect. It's, I mean, how confident would you guys be with this operator for genuinely customer-facing critical uh, usage as opposed to uh, a little bit less worried if I lose it? Well, th this particular one that we showed, uh, it's not production ready, I can tell yeah, you that. Yeah. Um, the one that is sort of open source already that, that we linked, if you don't have logs, if you have like, let's say e-commerce, it should work. I mean, as far as we work with it, it I think it's obviously up for sort of testing for your use case, but I, uh, they use it for quite a long time now, okay. like Zalando at their shop, so I guess right. it works. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. Yep, thanks. Any other questions? Oh. What metrics are you monitoring in order to know when to add more nodes or scale more less nodes and stuff? Um, or you we, don't know yet? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we initially the, the the metrics were CPU usage um, and also um, number of shards per node. So you can say I want at most five shards per node or something like that. That's what the original operator does. We added the disk thresholds, so if we, the, the one that Ciprian modified, like if you go over a specific disk, then we scale up. If we go under, we scale down. Um, and there, there's another one that has to do with disk, which uh, is like a safety net. So when you scale back down, you don't want to get over a specific um, disk usage because like, you don't want to run out of disk when you scale down or run into some sort of endless loop. So those are the metrics. The plan was to add something with, um, that has to do with search latency as well. We can pretty much get any metric that we want from Elasticsearch. Because these disk, disk metrics um, are from Elasticsearch itself, uh, like from CAD nodes or something like that. Yeah. We, we'd want to use metrics from inside Elasticsearch because Elasticsearch does quite a lot of stuff in the background. And if we use something from external sources like uh, some monitoring tool, uh, it may differ from the, sa the data that uh, Elasticsearch uses for internal uh, thresholds. So we cannot do for disk, uh, we cannot use for disk external tools. Um, I think the Zalando people are trying to extend their operator to use horizontal pod autoscaler. 
So that would make it pretty easy for us to gather more metrics and add the logs related ones uh, there. So we improve on that. But at the moment, it's uh, from what we read uh, in their comments, uh, they are heavily developing this feature. So we, we cannot do a merge of our code there or even discuss the possibility because we don't know how it will look. It's kind of frozen at the moment. Any other questions? Oh. Uh, hello. Uh, in in a in a big cluster that uh, has uh, big shards like 50 gig shards and I don't know 60 nodes or something like that, uh, how does the scaling up and scaling down performs? Uh, we did not test it with that size. Um, I think my recommendation would be, if you can, not get there and but rather split it in multiple smaller clusters. Um, I think for a larger cluster, what we would want is to scale in larger increments. Like you don't want to scale up all the time because we force rotate, and then it would be kind of suboptimal if we go 61, 62, 63, and then go back and so on and so forth. So I would add some sort of um, increments. We, uh, the operator al already has stuff like cooldown, both when you scale up, when you scale down. So it's not that jittery, and you can obviously configure that. But I would add some sort of steps so we don't, so we kind of reduce the noise. Um, and for uh, large shards, this is, again, something that you can have control of. And if you use it for time series data, I think 50, 60 gigabytes is kind of large. But of course, you cannot have like a million shards. So there's a, there's a trade-off there. You may be aware of that. Because um, if you have a lot of shards, then your cluster state becomes large. And then it's going to be difficult to coordinate that across the nodes. And that's, in my experience at least, ultimately the, the scaling limit of how much data you can put in a in a single Elasticsearch cluster, because at some point it becomes unstable because of the large cluster state that has to be coordinated. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, OK. Any other questions? All right, if not, thank you very much for attending. Um, hope you have thank a you. great rest of the conference. <laughs>